Well, happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to be here with you in God's house. You know, this week, for you sports buffs, this is the big week, isn't it? This is grand final stuff when they build up for all those finals. Well, I want to say thank you for coming to the grand final event. This is the event that celebrates the greatest event that has ever taken place in the history of mankind. Today we come together not to celebrate a team winning a, a, a game, but we celebrate the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And to me, every Sabbath is a good Sabbath, but Communion Sabbath is the best Sabbath. Never forget that, folks. Communion Sabbath is the best Sabbath. It's the one Sabbath to be at church, to draw near and dear to the Lord Jesus Christ. In your mind, in your eyes, what does desperation look like? What does desperation, what, what do you think in your mind classifies as being a situation of desperation? Just think about it for a moment. What would be a desperate situation? Would living in Aleppo at the moment be a desperate situation for you? Have you ever been in a situation of absolute desperation? Have you? I'm going to tell you briefly about a moment when I was in a situation of absolute desperation. It takes me back, takes you back again to the Solomon Islands. And while the ADRA director, I had to visit the island of Rennell. Now, the island of Rennell was famous in the Second World War because it has, a, it has a very large internal lake. And it was on that lake that the Americans stationed their amphibian base. There were some 250 amphibian planes located on that lake, and it was the centre of that activity. By the way, they're still there. When the Americans left, they pulled the bungs out and sunk them all to the bottom of the lake. They're still there, these amphibian planes. One of them didn't quite sink, but they're all there. When I went to the island of Rennell, I first of all went to the village in the south. And while there for three days, I, had only, I only received a bowl of rice at 10 o'clock at night for three days. I was becoming desperate for food. I was starving. Never been like that in my life. To go from that village to the northern village, we had to go on a trailer towed by a tractor. No springs. Three-hour ride, and I want to tell you, my backside was sore. I was desperate for some comfort. When we finished the tractor ride, we came to the most beautiful beach I've seen. There should be a hotel there, but it's so isolated there is no hotel. There was waiting for us at that beach a little canoe, a, what, two and a half metre canoe, three metre canoe with a 25 horsepower motor on the back of it. And we now had to go for a four hour canoe ride across this open water to the other end of the island. It was a perfect day for whale watching. Beautiful! But it all turned to custard very quickly. The storm came the waves came, and fear came. I have never been so petrified in my life. I don't mind being in a boat, but it's got to be smooth water. The waves became 10 metres high. They were all going over the top of us. We were bailing like crazy to survive. Survive. We were desperate. 
We did not know, but a week, a week earlier, a canoe had been sunk on that same passage. There was supposed to be a group of people gathering to meet us on the beach at the other end and help us, but they had actually given up waiting for us. They did not believe that we would survive that trip, but we did. We got there. But I want to tell you, it was only through prayer that we got there. It was only because God watched over us that we got there. Nothing else. All the elements were against us. But faith in the almighty God got us there. And we had a great time for three days and then we had to do it all over again. Go back. But on the return trip, God blessed us with a beautiful trip. But we do have moments like that in our life where we reach into desperation, where we become so desperate that we seek an outside source to rescue us and to help us. And I'm, I'm thankful that God came through that day. I'm very thankful. I want to take you to a passage in Scripture where there was a time of desperation. As never seen before in the history of the world, perhaps even more desperate than Adam's situation in the Garden of Eden because there was only a man and a woman being affected. But when we travel in time to Exodus chapter 16, we've got some three million people We've got a nation in absolute desperation. Why were those so desperate? Well, it's because they were sheltering in the nation of Egypt. But Egypt had become so fearful of the nation of Israel with its growing and multiplying that they were fearful that they were going to be overrun by the Israelites. And so they took desperate measures in their hands to annihilate the Israelite nation, to bring them into a subservient existence under that powerful Egyptian empire. But the Israelites... At that moment in desperation, cried out. After being there for nearly 400 years, they cried out. They cried out for deliverance because their, their situation could not be changed by themselves. They had managed up to that point. But when the Egyptian nation became hostile to who they were, they became desperate and they reached out. They reached out to God. And God delivered them miraculously. He took them through the Red Sea. He destroyed the Egyptian army. But when you come to Exodus chapter 16, it's not about any of that stuff. It's about food. It's about food. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Things had become desperate for the children of Israel. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died! By the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. 
when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Yeah. Imagine this mighty nation, this, this nation of God in a place where there is no food. They were ignoring the hardships of Egypt and wanting to return because at least they'd have a full belly. That's comfort to a lot of people, a full belly. And at this moment of time, it was all that Israel wanted was a full belly food. But they were desperate. They were in a place where there was no food. A state of emergency had been declared, if you like. And there were three million people affected by this. Come down to verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Maybe if God's not listening to you, maybe you need to start complaining. They were complaining big time. They were causing grief for the leaders of the nation of Israel. I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying, at twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Yes. Here is the God of Israel. Here is our God reaching into a desperate situation and meeting the need of his people. That's the God we worship, folks. That's the God we serve. That's the God who loves us. The God who is willing to provide. The God who is willing to, to deliver the God who is there who graciously cares for his people. This is one of the most beautiful pictures of a faithful God you will ever see is Exodus chapter 16. Because you find as you read the story that God is not just faithful for one meal, for one day, for one week, but instead he is faithful for how many meals, folks? How many meals? All day food for 40 years. All day food for 40 years. It was there. It never dried up. And he loved them so much that he wanted to spend the Sabbath with them and not have them spending time gathering food, doing whatever needed to be done. He said, look, folks, don't worry about it. On Fridays, I'll give you a double portion and you just will be looked after. What an amazing God we see here in Exodus chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. So it was that quails came up at the evening and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And then it is that Moses explains the plan of God, explains the love of God and tells them what they are to do and how they are to, to gather this food and how God will provide their need. From verses 16 to 30 onwards, God sets some boundaries. Sets some boundaries. If you want to be delivered from a place of desperation, there has to be boundaries put around you. 
A drug addict can't be rescued from drug addiction unless some boundaries are put into place. Don't touch the stuff is the first boundary you would put in place. But when you're in moments of desperation, boundaries are to be put into place. And the one thing that God wanted to protect more than anything else in this story is the Sabbath. He put some boundaries around the Sabbath. He put some boundaries around the special time with God. But they didn't listen, did they? Some of them didn't like the boundaries. Some of them didn't like the restrictions that God was placing upon them. Some of them wanted, still wanted full freedom. But full freedom is chaos. God's given every one of us full freedom. And we can do as we wish. But it's best, freedom is best with restrictions. There needs to be boundaries in life. And parents, I'm sure that's something that you've learnt as you've been raising your children. You just can't let them go off and do whatever they want to do when they're little. You've got to put boundaries in place. Well, that's a beautiful picture and a lesson that we learnt from our wonderful God. Let's come to verse 32 of chapter 16. By the way, when was the last time you read the Pentateuch? When was the last time you sat down and read the five books of Moses? Fantastic. When was the last time you sat down and read Patriarchs and Prophets? You get a wonderful understanding of these of the Pentateuch from that beautiful book, Patriarchs and Prophets. Let's have a look at verse 32. Then Moses says, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that you may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it, And lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is a tenth of an ephah. This event in the lives of Israel was one of the greatest events that ever took place in their life. It was so important that the act of God's generosity through those 40 years was memorialized in that a portion of it was taken and placed in the vessel where the Ark of the Covenant, where the testimony of the Lord was. It was to be forever respected as, as, as a monumental event in the lives of the children of Israel. Today, dear friends, we come to a table. We come to a meal that the Lord again has provided for us. As we read in that little passage just then, the children of Israel ate bread until they entered the promised land. Friends, children of Christ and of God, I want to encourage you to continue to eat this bread, to eat this emblem of the body of Christ until you see him. You know, there are many in our gatherings today who will not celebrate this event not celebrate this event. To me, that is a tremendous tragedy. And today, I would just like to encourage you as we prepare for the table of the Lord by by going through the service of foot washing, I would just want to say to you, if, 
This is not something that you have participated in for some time. Or it is something that maybe you've never participated in because you think we're mad. I just so want to say, let go. Let go. Because every one of us here are in a desperate situation. We're all in the wilderness of sin. We're all needing the bread of life. We're all needing to be saved. Every one of us. And everyone back then needed to participate in the bread that came from heaven and share in the benefits of it and the beauty of it, and so do we. So if this is something that you have, for some unknown reason, chosen not to do, I just want to say, let go. Let go. Let go. And come together. And wash one another's feet, and then come together and share in these beautiful emblems of Christ. When we come back, and just before we share the emblems of Christ, I'll share the rest of the story. Because Christ once preached on the bread from heaven, the manna. And we'll share that thought with you when we come back to the table of the Lord. So now let us, let us separate. Men, straight through the room there. Ladies, out into the hall. And... Parents, if you want to take your children to observe, you are more than welcome, even if they want to participate. I'm happy for that. Okay? Let's separate together. Thank you. Thank you for coming back to the house of the Lord for the second part. You know, I love the game of rugby, and it's not all over until the second half. You know, we've only just kicked off the second half, folks. We've, we've, we've gone through the, the first half and here we are now and um, we've come back together. So thank you for coming and completing the game and, um, and being with us. We're just going to ask the ladies if they will come forward and just uncover the table before we share the message of the Lord. In John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, Jesus talked about the wilderness experience. He never said much about the wilderness experience in his ministry, but in John chapter 6, he certainly turns the attention of the people to the time of the wilderness wanderings. And in John chapter 6, Jesus explained it this way. And um, it's found in verse 53 to verse 58, those who have their Bibles with them. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I, I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. The food that God gave to the children of Israel in the wilderness was of a temporary nature. It was only to serve the purpose and to sustain the children until they reached the promised land and then no more. They were living in the land of milk and honey and didn't need the food from heaven anymore. It was of a temporary nature. 
But every one of those people who entered into that promised land still died. That manna that fell in the wilderness for 40 years could not sustain life forever. But Jesus says, the bread of life of which I am, if you share in me, you will live forever. On one other occasion, he had talked to the woman at the well at Samaria. And everybody was drinking normal water and still dying. But Jesus says to the lady, if you drink this water, you will live forever. Friends, we may have forgotten that we are in a desperate situation. We are in a world of sin. We are living in a world of sin. There is chaos all around us. There is only one way out. And that's not by voting for a prime minister. That's by giving your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's by trusting in the almighty God and allowing him to meet our daily needs. And our daily need is Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ in every way. Jesus lifted himself up as the bread of life. Not the manna, not the bread that fell in the wilderness for 40 years, but the bread of life that offers to us all an eternal existence. And that is what God wants for every one of us, is an eternal existence. Let me read a little passage to you from the book Desire of Ages, page 389. To eat the flesh and to drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal saviour, believing that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him. It is by beholding his love, by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in, that we are to become partakers of his nature. What food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes part of our being. So Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal saviour. A theoretical knowledge will do us no good. We must feed upon him, receive him into the heart so that his life becomes our life. His love, his grace must be assimilated. And so as Jesus introduced to us himself as the bread of life, we learn these few things. There is no life apart from him. There is no life apart from him. We learn that eternal life is assured through him. But he said that we must remain in him. It's no good being a Christian up to the age of 25 and then forgetting about it. It's no good being a Christian up to the age of 60 and forgetting about it. It's to be a lifelong commitment. The one who feeds on him will live. And he who feeds on the bread of life, on this bread, the bread we bring to you today, will live forever. And so it is that we come to the beautiful passage in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul is gathered with his believers and he says to us in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You're also proclaiming that he lives. That's the most wonderful thing for us to know is that Christ lives. And because he lives, he can come back. He can, he can finish it. The full-time whistle will be blown one day soon. And we'll all be on the winning side because we're here today to celebrate in the beauty and the emblems of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to ask our Elder Rob to lead us now in prayer as he offers the blessing on the emblem, the bread of life. Thank you. If you're able, want to, you're able, willing to, to kneel, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this privilege of coming together this morning to participate in this communion service. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful love to us and thank you for allowing us to be together as brothers and sisters to commemorate the breaking of the bread. Lord, we look back in the annals of time, long, long time ago, when the plan of salvation was formulated in heaven, that if man should go astray, well, then Jesus would come and pay the price for the sins of man. Well, things did go wrong big time. Thankful, Lord, this morning that Jesus was willing to come to be born as a baby in a manger, to live among men, to work among men, and then to die among men, that each one of us here this morning might be saved. Lord, it is so good to be able to uh, take the bread this morning. And I do pray that as we remember the uh, Last Supper when Jesus broke the bread, distributed to his disciples and they ate, that he, he inter that he really became part of them in a positive way. And so we claim this morning, Lord, that as we take of this bread, it is broken, and as we eat of it, I do pray in a special way this morning that Jesus will become part of us. And in so doing, may we be willing to share him with others to the glory of your kingdom. Help us, Lord, as we witness for you in our daily lives that we might reflect the things we know about the sacrifice of Christ. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Just contemplate the music that is being played while we, uh, while we wait for it to be served. Would you sing with us the first verse of this hymn as the bread is given out? Nearer, still nearer.
And so it was, as Paul said, on that night they did take and they did eat, and we do remember it in the name of Jesus. Let us share in the emblem. Now, Elder Rob, our other Elder Rob, will now lead us in prayer as we prepare for the emblem of the spilt blood of Jesus. Father, as we come to your table this afternoon, uh, we, we come with a, an acute sense of our unworthiness to be here, of our unworthiness to come into the presence of the holy and just God. But we also come, Father, in confidence, confident that because of nothing that we've done, but because of what you have done on our behalf, that we can come into your presence, we can we can call you our Father. What a privilege that is. And as we drink this symbol of your spilled blood, now may we be aware, be reminded of the, the high cost that you paid, of the price that you paid for this gift that is offered so freely to us. Help us never to lose sight of just how much it cost you to buy our freedom from Satan and from sin. And as, as this uh, symbol enters our bodies and enters our bloodstream, may it change us to make us more like Jesus. We just praise you, Father, and thank you for the sacrifice that made this all possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just wait while we serve the... Uh, you're right, you already got? Lovely, thank you. Thank you, men. And so, yes, the whole story was told. The final whistle was to be blown on sin with the shedding of the blood of Christ. Let us enjoy the freedom that he has given us through this blood. Nearest, still nearer, Lord, to be thine, sin with its flies, I gladly Give me back Jesus. 
Jesus, my Lord crucified, give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Just as we sum up, could we ask if the young ladies could come and cover our table for us? Thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm waiting for the final whistle to be blown. I myself was quite happy to be sick, was quite happy to be inflicted with pain and suffering, I could bear that, but to see my son suffering cruelly with multiple cirrhosis and getting worse month by month, to now be nursing my wife through cancer, no, I've had enough. I want the whistle to be blown. I don't want to see my family suffer. I don't want to see anyone suffer. But this one thing I know that Jesus has already blown the whistle on sin. On that Friday, he died. On that Sunday, he rose. And he got the victory over sin. We just need him to blow the whistle on the life of sin and for that to end. I'm thankful that I've had this moment to celebrate with you the good news that Christ died for us, that Christ is alive for us, that Christ is coming again. And one day soon, the whistle's going to blow and we're going to rejoice and we're going to celebrate that. May you say with me, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Father, loving God, how beautiful it is that you reach into the lives of individuals in desperate needs, in moments of desperation. You reach out and you do all that you can. And we thank you for the beautiful picture that we have of your love in reaching down to the children of Israel and supplying their earthly need and sustaining them for those 40 years. Thank you, God, that you still sustain us, that you keep us, and that you meet, our, uh, you meet our moments of desperation. And I pray that one day soon, you will call us home, because we've stayed faithful to you. We've worshipped you. We've served you. But more importantly... We've shared in you, particularly the brokenness of your body and the spilling of your blood. Thank you that for the freedom that we have through those beautiful gifts. We pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.